Professor Andrus, uh, first of all, can you explain to me what is IFBB? IFBB is an institute at the University of Applied Science and Arts in Hanover, and we have about uh, 30 employees, and all the uh, issues are connected or linked to bioplastics and bio based uh, composites. So you've been uh, monitoring the bioplastics industry for some time. Uh, what, is, what is the size of the industry, can you tell me? Well, it's the industry is an, uh, an annual growth of about 20%. Uh, it sounds good, but the, the level is a, a really a low level. That means uh, bioplastic have a market share of about 1% uh, in comparison to the global plastic production. So uh, a, a, a minuscule amount compared to conventional oil-based plastics. Um, what are the main growth areas fueling that 20% uh, year-on-year increase? Oh, there is a strong increase, especially when we talk about durable uh, bio-based plastics for technical applications. That means we come back to the roots. The first plastics we developed many, many, many years ago, they were completely bio-based because there was no fuel, uh, no petrol-based feedstock was uh, available. So the first plastics are developed on, on, on cellulose, acetate, cellophane, uh, rubber, uh, linoleum, rayon, and all these well bacillate and all these well-known plastics, they are, were completely bio-based. And then we substitute these materials by petrol-based plastics. And now we come back to the roots. That means we want to produce durable bio-based plastics for technical applications. And especially these durable bio-based plastics will show the strongest growth in, within the next uh, f uh, years. And uh, how does it split between biodegradable and, um, and drop-ins? Oh, the question, if uh, or the the reason, um, uh, or the, yes, the reason for for material to be bio biodegradable is the chemical structure. It doesn't matter where the feedstock comes from. So that means that we were able to produce biodegradable or compostable plastics with fuel. Uh, but also the other way around, we were able to produce durable plastics based on based on renewable feedstocks. So uh, at the end, the Biodegradability is an end-of-life option, and the feedstock is a start, start, starting point of, of life, but these things are not connected to each other. So, for example, I mean, uh, is, there, is there more bio-PE or, or bio-PP or, or bio-PET? Uh, especially this so-called trouble in uh, bioplastics. That's mean, that means that we at the end. That means that we at, at the end we can expect the same chemical structure. So with the same chemical structure or similar chemical structure, we can also expect the same properties, the same utilization properties, the same processing properties, the same disposal behavior. Uh, so it, it's it's much easier to substitute uh, petrol-based PE, for example, with a bio-based PE or bio-based PET uh, can easily substitute a petrol-based PET, PET because we can expect the same properties. Uh, so they, these substitutes can go into the same uh, material recovery process or waste uh, stream as the conventional plastics, is that right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, which are the main user industries for bioplastics or bio-based materials? Oh, at the moment we find the most bioplastics uh, in the field of packaging application. I think it's a, a question of the, the history because the idea of the first bioplastics was to produce compostable packages. We want to solve the waste problem. And uh, that's one thing why we should use, I think it's also right to use bioplastics, because when we talk about packages, we talk about a short life. And especially for these short life products, we should use bioplastics. Uh, a lot of packaging, by definition, is, is very much a, a sort of commodity item um, which tends to suggest that uh, the margins are quite tight and yet of course bio-based uh, plastics are a lot more expensive than uh, conventional oil-based plastics. Would the bioplastics industry be looking at, at other industries, automotive for example, or, or maybe medical devices to get a better return do you think? Yes, it's a different question if we talk about the actual current situation. 
uh, in the current situation is that most plastics are used for, for packages. But in future, there is a, a shift from these packages to other applications like automotive industry, office uh, devices, um, sport, uh, sports, um, clothes, fibers. Uh, so that means that in future we will also use bio-based plastic for other applications because we want to continue the successful journey, let me say, that was possible only because we developed plastics. And will that be driven as much by uh, cost and, and return as performance? Oh, the, especially the cost uh, is a question of the production scale. And if we have mm. a low production scale, it means that the material is a little bit more expensive. And if the material is more expensive, the customer do not want to use the material. So the production scale will not increase. And uh, especially in the, uh, when we talk about renewable energy, let me say we, uh, we, we uh, cut this uh, circle. Uh, by uh, uh, special regulations and a su uh, support uh, of the bio-based uh, or the renewable energy. And I think, I think that um, uh, to, to help um, these new materials, we need also some regulations that help to introduce this material also in the market, not only in the field of energy. Uh, I think we need the same regulations for bio-based materials, because where the difference? If we use bio-based feedstock to produce energy, we can also use the bio-based feedstock to produce material then we can recycle the material and then we can also incinerate the material with an energy recovery. Well, yes, I mean, regulation and legislation is one way uh, to, to help to make it more competitive. Um, but in the absence of that, um, and given that there is a price discrepancy between uh, bio-based and, and conventional, um, and also taking into account that although it's a 20% year-on-year growth, it's still a very low uh, uh, base that it's working from. Uh, can you uh, foresee something happening, some some event or application that would give it that sort of quantum leap momentum that it needs to really get the, the volumes up? Uh, if, if the brand owners, and at the moment we have a few brand owners that will uh, um, that feel responsible for the things that will happen in the next uh, 20 or 50 years. So if we have enough brand owner that will uh, will make a clear commitment to these bio-based materials, I think then we will be able to reduce this gap, uh, this price gap between conventional plastics and bio-based plastics. To, to give you an idea, at the moment we talk about a price gap or uh, uh, bio-plastics are for example, if we uh, look to, to bio-based polyethylene or bio-based PET, we can say that these uh, bio-based materials are about 20% more expensive. And when we have a look to bio-based polyamides, we talk about a double price. That sounds much, but uh, for example, we introduce green electricity that is five or ten times more expensive than conventional electricity. It will happen, um, for whatever reason, uh, whether it becomes a sort of moral issue or a commercial issue, there is no doubt that it will happen. Um, but when it does, and when this industry really becomes a, a viable proposition, how sustainable is it going to be in terms of the resource required to feed it? Um, is, uh, um, when we... When we uh, um, consider that, or when we when we notice that we have the chance uh, for a cascade utilization. That means we use first we use bio-based feedstock to produce material, and then we can recycle the material, and then we can incinerate this material. It's it's much better to to use this or to, to go this way than uh, to incinerate fuel, petrol-based fuel, also or even to incinerate bio-based fuel. It's much more sustainable to maximize the benefit. And that is what we can do when we use bio-based feedstock to produce durable plastics for technical applications. So we get more than one use out of, out of the product. Um, so I mean, for example, uh, we could be using it for, for other things as well as for fuel. We could be using it for uh, animal feedstock, I dare say. 
Yes, there we have many different end-of-life options. We can also use, let me say, bio, biodegradable plastics. We can use uh, to or we can bring them in a biogas facility, and then we can uh, change the carbon into methane to into biomethane, and then we can use this biomethane to produce energy or even to produce new pla new plastics. So uh, that's fascinating. So in other words, this industry in future could be as much laboratory-based as land-based. Yes, uh, we need only a carbon source, and with this carbon source, we will be able to produce all plastics you, you can imagine. So, and and you see that there is a strong shift at the moment, or a shift. Let me let me say, the first bioplastic producers uh, 25 years ago, um, we find mainly agriculture-driven companies, and now we find the big chemical, well-known companies that produce bioplastics, and they have a strong understanding of the plastic market, and especially in Europe, we we have a strong plastic history. His, history but we have no oil so i think also in the future we play a, a major role in the field of bioplastics and uh, it doesn't matter where the feedstock comes from we have the knowledge to use this feedstock uh, to produce plastic to improve the quality of the material uh, to to modify the material we have the market here the plastic knowledge the uh, companies that produce the the, the uh, machines that are necessary for the processing of these plastics the additives the chemical industry so we have all the things in in Europe and I think uh, that we must not afraid for the future also in future we will have plastics uh, but I think we will in, in the future we have more bio-based plastics than petrol based plastics I don't know how long it will take if we talk about 10 years or 20 years or 50 years but I'm sure that there is no real alternative um, we need carbon and it's the easiest way to use bio-based carbon Professor Andres thank you very much Yes, it was a pleasure for me.